Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the common law. But first I wanted to just tell you I'm sorry I didn't get anything posted over the weekend. My wife and I spent some time together down at our house in, Be in Destin. Had a marvelous time. Uh, we have two of our favorite restaurants down there. One of them is Pepito's. It's a nice little Mexican restaurant. We go there for lunch. Uh, because A, it's cheaper, and B, you can get a small chimichanga, and it's very, very good. So we went there, and then uh, the next day, on uh, Saturday, we went to a place called Lynn's Asian Cuisine. Now, we've eaten at Lynn's, I know, probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 times, and we've probably had the Mongolian beef there seven, eight, nine times. I don't know. We really like the Mongolian beef. We went and had the Mongolian beef, and I swear somebody must have looked at us and said, ha, I bet they can't handle a few peppers. And of course they were right. My wife doesn't like really spicy food. They put enough pepper in that thing to set my mouth on fire. And I'm kind of a pepper belly. I kind of like spicy food, but that was pretty spicy. So tonight, my act of kindness is going to be to make Mongolian beef for my wife when she comes home from work. Um... I'm going to use the recipe from Sam the Cooking Guy that I found here on YouTube. It's a great channel. If you haven't checked it out, you should check it out. So let's talk a little bit about the common law. When we broke away from merry old England, we kept our language. <laughs> Nobody wanted to learn to speak French, and certainly um, the Native Americans weren't teaching us their languages. Rather, we kept English and we kept a lot of other things. We kept certain traditions. There are still a lot of places in New England where having afternoon tea derives from a centuries-old tradition that comes from England. The point of this is that we didn't have to create everything out of whole cloth. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, please feel free to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and makes it possible for me to continue to do this. That's it. That's the commercial. The king had courts. We knew how their courts worked. We knew how our courts, we wanted them to work. But a lot of the things that we had in terms of the law, we did not need to recreate. We just borrowed them from merry old England. And in fact, the Constitution incorporates the common law of England at the time of the founding. Now, if you take a look at the way that courts in England are organized today, this is how they are organized today. We have the King's Bench Division, we have the Chancery Division, and the Family Division. There is an appeal to the Court of Appeal, and then, again, if that doesn't go well, you can take it to the United Kingdom Supreme Court. This is the way the court system in England has evolved from the 18th century. It was not that way in the 18th century because the king still held the majority of the power. With apologies to people who probably know a great deal more about the English court system than I do, this was basically the setup. There was the king's bench division, the, the king's courts, and then there was the Chancery Division, and these two had two different aspects to them. The King's Bench Division was, were courts of law. In other words, this is where the law was made with respect to how things happen. What's an assault? What's a battery? What's conversion? What is trespass to chattels? All of these things were falling under the King, the King's Courts. But the king's courts could be quite harsh, and as a result, a chancery division was set up, and the chancery division was the court of equity, the place where you could go to get an injunction, a temporary restraining order, where if there wasn't a contract in place, you could get a remedy through something called quasi-contract. All of these kinds of things that fell under what is now the law of equity in the United States came out of the Chancery Division. 
Well, every time they had a noteworthy case in either of these two from the about the 15th century on, they documented it. They wrote the case up and they kept them in a readily accessible list of laws and, and decisions. And people could go there and find out what the law was. That's how lawyers became lawyers. They went to the court and studied the law. They studied decisions. And there was no Westlaw or Lexis at the time. Keep that in mind. They had to know what book to pull, where to find the case, and what to read about. I'm sure there were probably indexes that someone created, but they couldn't be as comprehensive as what we now have through computers. This is how we got the common law. Whatever they had in these two divisions up to the time of the founding of the country, that became the basis for how we would decide the same kinds of cases. In the United States, there may be multiple divisions of a court. In Missouri, we have the circuit court, and below that sits the associate circuit court, and below that sits the municipal court, all governed by the same rules of the Supreme Court as the guiding body that directs how courts operate in the state of Missouri. If you get a bad result in municipal court, you can take it to the associate circuit court. If you get a bad result there, you can take it to the circuit court. And if you get a bad result there, you can take it to the court of appeals. And in some cases, all the way up to the Missouri Supreme Court. And if it contains a national kind of issue like constitutional rights, it can go all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. That's how Missouri courts were organized. I'm sure that in most cases, all of the other states have similar, though not precisely the same kinds of court systems. But both law and equity are combined in those systems. In other words, if you want an injunction, you don't have to go to a separate court to get it. You go to your circuit court or your uh, whatever district court, for example, in some cases. In Kansas, what would be the circuit court in Missouri is the district court in Kansas. So you'd go to the district court and you would ask for an injunction or a temporary restraining order. Uh, those are the sorts of things that, that how they work. Now, common law derives from judicial decisions. That's the only place it comes from. Common law is basically the collected wisdom of the body of judicial officers from about the 15th century through today as modified by changing conditions. The, com the common law changes every day in every state across the country. And it does it in different decisions by the circuit courts, the courts of appeal, and the state supreme courts. You may recall recently where I did a case with respect to Michigan. What Michigan did was it adopted the restatement view on open and obvious dangers. Instead of considering it as part of duty, it now considered it as part of the breach of duty, and that affected how comparative fault applied. In England, at the founding, there was not comparative fault. There was contributory negligence. And if you were even 1% contributorily negligent, then you lost. That's the way the law worked at that time. And over the years, the law has softened in that regard. We now have comparative fault. Let's suppose that you're driving down the road and a truck stops immediately in front of you while you're going 70 miles an hour. Now, you happen to look down at your phone at just that moment, and when you looked up, you had to slam on the brakes to avoid hitting that truck and you couldn't do it. You still wound up hitting the truck. You bruised your face up. You damaged your car. Well, at common law, prior to the adoption of comparative fault, you would have lost because you were contributorily negligent. You looked away from the, from the road. When you are driving, you are required to keep a careful lookout at all times. When you look down at your phone, you are not keeping a careful lookout. So you would have lost. But under comparative fault, 
You go in and you say, look, you know, I saw my phone ding. I looked down to see whether it was a message or not. I wasn't going to read the message. I just looked down to my phone and that's when this guy slammed on his brakes. The jury would have the right to consider, one, whether you were being truthful, and two, to what extent it contributed to the accident. Were you following too closely? All of those kinds of things are going into this decision about comparative fault. And as a result, if, they, if the jury finds that you have $100,000 in damages, but you're 40% at fault, you're only going to get $60,000 in terms of damages. That's how comparative fault works. It tries to be a bit more fair, a bit more equitable than contributory negligence was. was. Comparative fault is an American invention, and I'm not even sure whether that's been incorporated into English law. But every state's common law differs from every other state's common law because the common law of Missouri is written by Missouri judges, and the common law of New York is written by New York judges. Now, one of the things that the restatements do, there's a restatement of torts, there's a restatement of judgments, there's a restatement of agency, there's a restatement of contracts. All of these restatements attempt to harmonize the law and make it essentially uniform in the ways that it can be uniform. It is never going to be completely uniform, but that's the goal of the restatement, to try and harmonize the law so that it comes together and you can have a reasonable expectation that if you, you know, if you're involved in an accident in Illinois, that essentially the same rules apply as in Missouri. Now there will be tweaks and there may be statutes that change things. Now here is an other interesting sort of quirk about the state laws and, and common law. A state can essentially remove a right of recovery under the common law. That's what they did when they created workers' compensation. But in order to eliminate a right, the right to sue your employer for damages, they had to create a substitute right, a quid pro quo, so to speak, so that, yes, you cannot sue your employer, but you still are entitled to some compensation. Now, anybody who's been through the workers' compensation system knows that it is not anywhere near as bounteous as going to court and filing a case there and recovering in circuit court or district court. But it's there, and it was done essentially to make it easier for people to recover against their employer's insurance carrier when they were hurt and reduce the overall cost to the employers. The legislature can also modify a common law remedy. For example, in Missouri, the right to sue a physician for medical negligence has always been a right that's been there in common law. Over the course of the years, the, the legislature has tried numerous times to try and reduce the amount that people can collect in medical malpractice judgments. Now, part of that is thought to be a, an outgrowth of the need to keep doctors available in the state. You don't want to have doctors running off to some other more favorable jurisdiction because they're less likely to get sued there. So, for example, they put in statutory damages caps. If you are injured by medical malpractice in the state of Missouri several years ago, there was a cap of, I believe it was uh, close to $500,000, it had started out at $350,000, and then they indexed it to the inflation, and so it had grown to almost $500,000. The insurance companies, who are always the people who push this, felt that that was too much, so the, le the legislature cut it back, and when they did, plaintiff's attorneys sued, and they got essentially got it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, nope, you are denying folks due process. This is a common law right, and you can't do that. As a result, the legislature essentially eliminated the common law right to medical negligence, and they instituted a statutory action for medical negligence, 
and imposed a hard cap inside the statute. Without going into a great deal of detail, I would just point out that this is not really very fair. Caps are unfair for two reasons. One, the jury is never told that there's a cap, that the most someone is ever going to get is three hundred or four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars. So they give them ten million dollars thinking that they're doing the right thing and then the judge winds up cutting it back and they're never told that. That's one of the reasons I think it's terribly unfair. The other reason that's unfair is when you have someone who is catastrophically injured, for example, paralyzed from the neck down. That is somebody who is never going to get up and go to the bathroom again. They are always going to be tied to a bed or a wheelchair. They're going to have to have constant nursing care to, in, to avoid getting pressure sores. They may require a mechanical ventilator to continue breathing. And yet, if that error is related to a, a physician's failure to do the right thing, well, tough. You know, they're limited to $700,000 or whatever it is, whatever the cap is in that state. Well, that's the most you're going to get for being catastrophically injured. Now, anything that's economic damage is usually not capped, but non-economic damages, pain, suffering, disability, disfigurement, all of those are capped. The legislature can modify the common law. They don't usually do it, but they can. The common law differs from the statutory law in that the statutory law is made by the legislature. They set speed limits. The legislature tells you how long you have to serve in prison if you commit an assault or you defraud somebody or you rob a bank. And all of these things are necessarily part of the judicial system, but they are viewed differently than the common law. And statutes are looked at from the standpoint of what was the legislature's goal, and, and essentially when a court interprets a statute, what it's doing is trying to give effect to what the legislature set in motion. And they do that by reading the plain language of the statute. So when you hear someone talk about the common law, what they're talking about is judge-made law. Law that started with a case or controversy. For example, somebody got hit in a car and worked its way up through the court system to a reported decision. And that's where the common law comes from. I have to tell you, over the weekend, I was coming out of our local quick trip with two big 32-ounce sodas in my hand because my wife likes fountain sodas a lot better than she likes stuff out of a bottle. I, I have no idea why, but she does. So I had two of them in my hand, and normally what I do is I turn around and I use my posterior to open the door, the double doors that are there. But this lady opened the door and gave me a big smile, and I walked out, and I told her, thank you. People are kind, and if at all possible, you return that kindness. And so I had an opportunity to return this kindness. I had to get a couple of things from the fresh market down in Destin over the weekend, and I went to the first register as I came up, and there was a little redheaded girl. She looked like she might have been 17, 18, 19. I don't know. But she said, can I help you? And she had this beautiful smile. And so I told her, I said, you know, I am way too old to flirt with someone. But I did just want to tell you, I think you have a beautiful smile. And I think my wife would agree on that so that she knew I wasn't, you know, trying to do anything inappropriate or hit on her. I wanted her to know, A, I was married, and B, I thought she had a beautiful smile. And if possible, her smile got more beautiful when I told her that. So I felt like I had done a little bit of a kindness for her. If you have the opportunity today, please pass it on. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And if we can start a big enough fire, maybe we can change the world just by being kind to one another. Thanks for watching. Catch me down here at the beach next time.
If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.